morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rosemary Bartlett with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast, Standard 90.1 2007, an overview of the envelope requirements, the last in the three-part series on 90.1 2007, brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy's Building Energy Codes Program. For those of you wanting continuing education credit for the event today, a link will be provided at the end of the webcast. AIA members should write down the link and go to that link and provide us their names and AIA membership numbers, and we will submit the information to AIA for their credit. In addition, anyone wanting a certificate of completion to self-report to a professional organization should write down the link to go generate and print one. We're very happy to have as our speaker today, John Hogan with the Seattle Department of Planning and Development. Welcome, John. Please begin. Thanks, Rose. Welcome, everyone, to today's presentation. Um, before we get into a discussion of the building envelope requirements for the 2007 version of Standard 90.1, I'd like to give you a little background. Um, my experience, I've worked with the City of Seattle now developing and implementing energy codes for close to 30 years. I'm the former chair of the 90.1 Envelope Subcommittee, and I'm also the chair of the Standard 189 Committee for High Performance Green Buildings, and I've been an active participant in the IECC process. So that uh, gives you a sense of um, the activities I've participated in before. I have some good experience and background on this, and let's move into the presentation. So this is the third in the series. As you know, um, we've talked about mechanical and lighting. The building envelope criteria are primarily contained in Chapter 5, but there are a number of important appendices. Appendix A contains um, default U factors for various types of assemblies. And this is very useful information uh, if you want to show compliance with the overall performance of the assembly as opposed to just the R value of the insulation, for example. You can look up the assemblies in Appendix A. It will convert that over, show you the R value, what the performance is of the assembly. So it will save you lots of calculations. It helps both the building officials, the plans reviewers, and it helps designers. The building envelope criteria has been contained in Appendix B. The methodology for doing the trade-off option, this is the one that complements the prescriptive option, is in Section 5.6. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but primarily that is captured in the software, the ENVSTD software that comes with Standard 90.1. So this material is mostly for the writers of the software. It's not something you need to be so familiar with. Appendix D contains the climate data. Now, within Appendix D, that material, I'll show you some slides later on with U.S. information. A lot of that has been also moved into ASHRAE Standard 169, and Standard 169 will continue to be upgraded over time, so there will be more extensive climate data. It includes U.S. and Canada, but more and more international locations. Appendix E contains a description of the various addenda that have been incorporated in the 2007 version. So these are changes from the 2004 version that have been incorporated in, into 2007. There are 40-some addenda. Um, they cover all the different portions of the standard. There are some key envelope ones. Um, for the criteria tables, the opaque assemblies and the fenestration, those have almost all been completely updated this time around. So those are um, a couple of the key addenda. And there's also been a bit of work done with the vestibule requirement and some revisions to the default assemblies in Appendix A. And I'll focus more on those as we go through this. And lastly, I wanted to mention the performance rating method. This is a, actually Appendix G of the standard. And you want to um, use this if you're showing compliance with some of the green building standards. Um, standard 90.1 is the baseline, and so this leads you through the process of complying with that. We won't go into much detail about that today, but I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. So having given you that background, let's talk about Chapter 5 itself. 
So the way Chapter 5 is laid out, there are some general requirements in the beginning, 5.1. 5.2 indicates what the compliance options are. There are mandatory provisions in 5.4, which you always have to comply with. And then when you go to 5.5 or 5.6, there's the option there of complying with either a prescriptive option or doing the building envelope trade-offs option. Now be aware these are both options within the envelope chapter itself. If you want to do trade-offs for the entire building, you can look at Section 11, and that allows you to do trade-offs between envelope, mechanical, and lighting. The trade-off option in 5.6 is just limited to the building envelope itself, where you might um, put in more insulation to compensate for windows that don't comply or something like that. Within Section 5.7 and 5.8, they talk about the submittals to have a complete package to document compliance with Standard 90.1 and some detailed information about um, how we'd show that you meet the NFRC rating requirements for fenestration, for example, or how to make sure the installation is installed correctly. Now let's move on to some of the general descriptions here just to set the categories. And a lot of this material and is carried over from the 2004 version, so if you're familiar with 2004, you won't see many changes here at all. I will highlight the changes later when we see other changes. So there's three space conditioning categories. There's a non-residential condition space, residential condition space, and semi-heated. The non-residential condition is pretty straightforward. It's all the occupancies other than residential. The residential condition space, space is used primarily for living and sleeping, including but not limited to dwelling units, hotel, motel, guest rooms, dormitories. And then those are um, uses that you might see included in Group R, for example, in some of the building codes. There are some other things included in residential in Standard 90.1, such as dormitory or nursing homes, patient rooms, and hospitals, and some of the other categories here, prisons. These are things that might be considered an institutional occupancy in some of the building codes. But they're considered residential for standard 90.1. The notion is that there are people there 24 hours a day, and so it's a different occupancy than offices, for example, where people are not there at night usually. Lastly, the other category is semi-heated space. And within that, it's a space heated by a heating system whose output capacity is greater than or equal to 3.4 BTUs per square foot, so 1 watt per square foot, but is not a conditioned space. Now, if we drill down a little further into this, a conditioned space is considered a cooled space, a heated space, or an indirectly conditioned space. So to be note that cooled space is anything whose capacity has a cooling system with an output greater than 5 BTUs per square foot of floor area. So you compare that with the 3.4 on the previous page, you see there's not much of a difference there. For heated space, it's a similar type of system but the reference criteria is in Table 3.1. It, it varies some by climate. Points to be aware of that conditioned space does not mean air condition. It includes heated only spaces. And as a result of these different thresholds, very few spaces qualify as semi-heated. To, to go further along this point here, there's discussion in 5.1.2.2 about an assumption of conditioned spaces. So spaces shall be assumed to be conditioned and shall comply with the requirements for conditioned space at the time of construction, regardless of whether mechanical or electrical equipment is installed at the building or included in the building permit application at that time. So the key point here is if you submit a building permit and it's only for the shell of the building, that does not mean you're exempt from the installation of the window requirements. You still have to comply with those. And for example, in our city, it's Seattle, it's fairly common for large buildings that the shell will be constructed first and then mechanical and electrical will come later. But the insulation, all that needs to be done at the time of the construction of the shell. Now there is an exception here if approved by the building official. And there are uh, atypical cases, but some cases such as lumber storage where it's really likely that the building would not be heated to cool later on. But we do not give this exemption for warehouse type of spaces. 
because this has been a key compliance problem in the past where um, owners have built a shell building and then it's later on a tenant comes forward and the tenant is surprised to find out that oh they can't just move right in you know they have to inflate the walls and inflate the roof and it's obviously much more cost effective for a warehouse for example to inflate the roof when you're constructing it you know you've got a maybe a 20 24 foot ceiling you got scaffolding or whatever the system is you've got set up to um, install the structure to the thought of coming back later on and trying to insulate that it'd be a much more costly situation so those are things that need to be taken care of right away so let's shift to the climate criteria and climate zones are defined in figure B1 which I'll show you in a minute so for the United States it's fairly straightforward there's a map of climate zones and there's also a table which specifies them by county so as long as you know the county that the building is going to be constructed in, then you can easily find the climate zone criteria. For Canada, there's a separate table B2 in the appendix. And for international locations, there's a table B3. Um, obviously, there are the most locations for the US. There are somewhat fewer for Canada and um, fewer for international. So if a location is not listed, there is criterion table B-4 that you can use to determine what the actual applicable criteria table will be. As we go through here, I'm going to show some examples of what the envelope criteria was for the 2004 version and then for the 2007 version. And I'm going to use Climate Zone 5 as the basis for that. So Climate Zone 5 is a broad swath across the US that includes cities like Pittsburgh, um, Boston, Chicago, on to Omaha and Denver, down to Flagstaff, up to Reno, and to Vancouver, British Columbia. Now here's a picture of the climate zone map. So on this one, you can see this climate zone 5 that I mentioned is in green. And within this, the hottest climate zones are the southern part, and starting at climate zone 1. In the continental US, that really is pretty much Miami. But it also includes Hawaii and other tropical locations like Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Climate zone, the seven you see is in the northern tier and the tip of Maine. It also includes um, roughly half of Alaska. And then climate zone eight is the northern half of Alaska. Now moving on to the early to the, some other mandatory provisions. For insulation, the mandatory provisions are in section 5.4.1 and in conjunction with 5.8.1. And as we talk about each of the opaque assemblies, I will talk about specific criteria there. For fenestration and doors, criteria is in 5.4.2 and 5.8.2. And again, as we talk about fenestration, I will talk about those details. And the air leakage criteria are in section 5.4.3. And we'll cover those right here. I do want to make sure, for those of you who are using ASHRAE standard for some of the green building programs, such as the US Green Building Council's LEED program, that requires compliance with all of the mandatory provisions, regardless of how energy efficient the building is or how great the energy savings are. So these items, which we're going to talk about now in the um, such as in the early good section, those always need to be complied with. Talking about air leakage, um, the first criteria is for building envelope sealing. And this requires that the all openings be sealed, caulked, gasketed, or weather stripped. It, it's a pretty general requirement. The fenestration and door criteria in 5.4.3.2 is more specific. So it sets air leakage criteria. For most products, it's 0 0.4 CFM per square foot maximum. However, for glazed swinging doors and revolving doors, it's a higher value. It's 1.0 CFM per square foot. And the rating procedures are listed in standard 90.1. There's several different options of how you can get those window ratings. There is a requirement for loading dock weather seals in climate zones 4 to 8. And this is some material that would go around the door so that when the truck backs up against it, there's no air gap there. So 
So when the truck is parked and they're unloading the goods, it will limit the air leakage into your warehouse type of space. I.4.3.4 contains requirements for vestibules. And this is where there have been some changes. And um, the intent, a lot has to do with clarification, but there's also some slight increase in stringency. So within that section, vestibules, it requires that building entrances that separate condition space from the exterior shall be protected with an enclosed vestibule. Now, a couple of key terms there. One is the term building entrance. And there's a definition in Chapter 2 of building entrance. That says any doorway, set of doors, turnstile, vestibule, or other form of portal are ordinarily used to gain access to the building by its users and occupants. So the key thing there is that we're talking about an entrance that's ordinarily used to gain occupancy. So this does not apply to doors that are fire exit doors, you know, that people would use for emergency egress. We're really talking about vestibules on the, the main access doors. It's not listed, limited necessarily to only one door, though. So if, you, if you're in an urban area, you have a full block development, they've got entry doors on two sides or four sides even, you would need to have vestibules on whatever sides have what are considered building entrances. Now within the text itself, there's also been some revisions at the end of that. There had been some questions that had come up about, well, um, can you put heat in a vestibule? And if you wanted to do that, where do you draw the line between what's the building envelope versus what is inside or outside of that? So the language at the end of 5.4.3.4 says that the exterior envelope of conditioned vestibules shall comply with the requirements for a conditioned space. So if you're in a very cold climate and you decide you want to put in some baseboard heat or something, within the vestibule itself, then the outside door is considered part of the building envelope, and that would need to comply with whatever the fenestration requirements are. Um, if you have another situation where you do not install any heating or cooling within the vestibule itself, then the interior and exterior of the unconditioned vestibule shall comply with the requirements for a semi-heated space. So that's the difference there. Now, there are some key exceptions to this, um, revolving doors, um, small spaces. And those small spaces are considered to be, for the colder climates, 5, 6, 7, and 8, it's the spaces that are less than 1,000 square feet in area. So if you have some small retail tenants on the ground floor of a 20-story office building, as long as they're small spaces, then they would not need a vestibule into their particular space. Um, and there's also a, another more general exception if the door is open directly from a space that's less than 3,000 square feet in area and separate from the building entrance. So as long as these retail tenants are ones that are small spaces and, again, not connected to the or open to a, a large building lobby. There's another exception for Milder climates three and four that says that the building is less than four stories above grade and less than 10,000 square feet in area, it would be exempted. So this would exempt some smaller retail buildings, but some of the big box retail stores, even though they're less than four stories above grade, yeah, they would be more than 10,000 square feet in area, and those would need vestibules. And uh, we mentioned a couple of other exceptions. One is for building interest is in buildings in climate zones 1 and 2. So in the very warmest climates, you don't need vestibules. And they're not required on doors opening directly from a dwelling unit. So if you've got a 15-story high-rise residential building and you've got um, balcony doors, things like that, or sliding glass doors going out to a deck, you don't need vestibules on those. Now let's move on to the prescriptive criteria. Within the prescriptive criteria, and remember this is one of two options, you can use 5.5 prescriptive or 5.6, the ENV STD approach. The prescriptive is the simplest. You don't have to enter any data into computer software. There's three categories of roof, four categories walls above grade, wall below grade, three categories of floors, 
in addition to slab on grade floors, opaque doors, two categories. And within fenestration, one of the big changes this time around is there are now four vertical glazing categories. There were previously two, but they were also configured differently. So the structure for vertical glazing is quite different from what it was previously. Now it's based on frame material type as opposed to whether it's operable or fixed window. And for skylights, there are three similar categories. So overview, big picture, the category is all the same except for vertical glazing where there are significant differences. Within the opaque assemblies, there are two compliance options. And they're spelled out in section 5.5.3. First of all, there's one for the R value of the installation alone. So when you do show compliance in that method, it's only the added insulation and framing cavities and continuous insulation. And this is defined in this nominal R value in the definitions chapter. It does not include any air films or building materials. So the way this is spelled out, it's meant to be easy for designers, easy for both plane reviewers and inspectors. You know, it just talks about the R value itself. If you have something where you've got a built up assembly and you want to take credit for various different layers, you can go through and use that process. Um, that option directs you to normative appendix A. So wherever an assembly is listed in Appendix A, then you need to use those values for compliance and not determine your own values. So let's talk about the opaque assemblies and some of the specific criteria. And remember, I'm going to focus on Climate Zone 5 here. So within Climate Zone 5 of the roof category, the first one is roof with insulation above deck. And this is a case where all the insulation installed above and outside of the roof structure, and it's continuous. So this would be a very common commercial building, got a flat roof, and the insulation is up above that. Um, for 2004, the general requirements were for R15, continuous insulation in Climate Zone 5. That's been bumped up a notch to R20, continuous insulation, for the 2007 version. And you see the comparable U factor in the, in the box there on the right is 0 0.048. Now, um, when we're talking about this insulation, sometimes if this is done with a, you know, it's a wood frame structure and you have continuous insulation above the structure, people will cant the wood framing, so the, the roof rafters, and then you have a continuous thickness for the continuous insulation. When people do concrete deck, however, usually that's poured flat, since it's typical to pour a sloped concrete deck. And what that means is people often taper the insulation. And when it's tapered, be aware that you cannot average R values. You can average U factors, but not R values. So you would need to show either compliance with the minimum R values or go through and use the assembly U factors for compliance if you have that situation. Also, I'd note there's an exception that allows a reduction in the insulation requirements if you have what's considered a cool roof. So it gives some benefit in the warmer climates and climate zones uh, 1, 2, and 3 primarily for that cool roof. The second opaque roof category is metal building roofs. And when we talk about metal building roofs, we're talking about a surface. It's metal surface. It's structural. There's no vented cavity and it's steel framing members. So it's not simply the material that's the roof. You can have a metal covering over wood framing, and that's not considered metal building. This is something where all the construction is metal. Um, here, and you'll see this um, for all the different climate zones, for metal building roofs and walls, there were not any changes between the 2004 and the 2007 version. There is work going on for the 2010 version, and I would expect you would see some revisions for the 2010 version. A couple of comments here. Uh, generally, the insulation, when you install it, has to be installed in a manner to achieve the full thickness. Section 5.8.1.2 does contain an exception here that says for metal buildings, it's allowable to compress the insulation between the roof insulation 
the roof skin and the structure. And this is typically what happens when the insulation is draped over the purlins. Um, there are some assembly U factors in table A2.3. And there were some revisions, some new assemblies added this time around. So it's a little more extensive than the previous table from the 2004 version. And again, the exception also applies here for the cool roof. The last category is attic and all other roofs. This includes typical small commercial type of buildings with wood framing where you would think about, um, say, insulation being blown into an attic space. But it includes any other categories that are not specifically listed. And here for 2007, the inflation has been bumped up a notch to R38. Previously, it was R30 in 2004 in Climate Zone 5. A couple of points um, to note here in the installation instructions. So section 5.8.1.8 indicates that you cannot install the roof insulation on suspended ceiling with removable ceiling tiles. As you might imagine, it's very easy to put that insulation in when the building is first constructed. It all looks very nice. And then people go in to move the lighting fixtures around, or they go up to work on the sprinkler system maybe that's above the suspended ceiling. The insulation gets pushed out of the way and never gets put back in the same place. And so it's not a good installation system. So the standard 90.1 prohibits the insulation from being installed there for um, compliance with the standard. It also prohibits um, recessing lighting fixtures into the insulation unless the area is less than 1% of the roof area. And if you think, think of a typical 2 by 4 troffer, which might be 8 square feet installed at 8 by 8 or 8 by 10 on center, 64, 80 square feet, you see that that's going to be, say, 10% of the square footage. And so in that situation also, even if you had a gypsum board ceiling that wasn't suspended ceiling tiles, it was a hard ceiling, you wouldn't be able to recess the light fixtures with typical 2 by 4 troffers into that because the area would be too large. This would allow you to put a few recessed can lights, but not a great amount of lighting into the insulation. And again, the goal here is we want to complete continuous insulation. Every time where you've got a gap, it's a short circuit, and you have much higher heat loss. A couple of other points. Section 5.8.1.4 requires baffles around the eave vents, so you maintain the insulation above that. And there are some U factors, default tables in Appendix A, A2.4 for wood joists and A2.5 for steel joists. And I would note that there is a possible reduction if you have a single rafter roof to install slightly less insulation. Now let's switch over to the second major category, wall above grade. We'll talk about mass walls first. So this is any wall that has a heat pick capacity exceeding 7 BTUs per square foot per degree Fahrenheit or a material unit weight of 5 BTUs per square foot if it's over 120 pounds. Now, the situation here is that typically uh, most um, concrete block walls, um, thicker concrete walls, will comply with this criteria. Base brick will not comply with this. So if you've got a wood frame or a metal stud wall that's got some face brick, it's not usually going to take you into this above grade wall into this mass category. The criteria for 2004 is bumped up to R11.4. Um, continuous insulation. Uh, previously, it was R7.6. And continuous insulation means it's continuous across all the structural members without thermal bridges other than fasteners. And that's the definition section 3.2. So be aware this does not mean insulation between metal studs or Z channels. This is really um, insulation, which is um, only the insulation. So glued to the masonry wall or with some tiny metal clips that are just fastening it. If you have the wood or metal studs, then you need to use the U-factor approach. And there are tables uh, in Appendix A, A, 3.1A. And the heat capacity for the various different assemblies is in tables A, 3.1B, C, and D. So you can take a look at those if you need to look up the heat capacity. And again, a lot of that reference material is in Appendix A, so you shouldn't have to go to different um, 
handbooks or whatever to find that, you should be able to find it. Second category for walls, um, upgrade metal buildings. So similar to metal building roofs, we're talking about something that's metal spanning members supported by steel structural members. So it's not a steel stud wall that has some other material on the outside. It's not a wood stud wall that happens to have some sort of metal facing on it. It's really a metal building type of construction. Wall insulation requirements are 13 here, 2007. Again, as mentioned previously for the roof, you are allowed to compress the insulation between the structure and the wall skin. And for the assemblies here, look in table A3.2. The third wall above grade is a steel framed wall. And this is the typical steel stud wall, but it also includes the portion of curtain wall system that where you're insulating say behind the spandrel glass. And so it's it's not the vision portion of the spandrel system. Um, the insulation requirements here for Climate Zone 5 um, bumped up in 2007 to be R13 cavity insulation plus R7.5 continuous insulation. So this means you'd have a, say, a 4 inch deep, 3 and a half or 4 inch stud, and then you've got or a, a Z channel. And then one and a half or two inches of continuous insulation over that metal stud to break the thermal bridging. So when you do this um, cavity insulation, again, it's very important to do this continuous continuous insulation to address the thermal bridging. Um, there are the assembly U factors in Table A 3.3, but there's also some good information at the end of Appendix A in Table A 9.2b. It shows the effect and the derating of the insulation when you install it within the metal studs. So if you've got R13 insulation and you install it between 2x4s or C channels, you only achieve an R6.0. So you're losing more than half of the R value. It's going through the metal. Those may be very skinny little metal studs, but their conductivity is very high. And so the heat will always flow wherever the path of least resistance is. So that's where the heat's going to flow. And I would also note that for R19, it's even worse. You have a 6-inch stud. You only achieve R7.1. So as designers, the point here to take away is that try to minimize the amount of insulation you put between metal studs. Go with a smaller stud, smaller Z-channel, and as much continuous insulation as you can. You get much more effective thermal performance if you do that. For above grade walls, the last category is wood framed, includes wood stud walls, but all other wall types. Here the insulation increased from R13 cavity insulation now with R3.8 continuous insulation. So here this could be half inch, three quarter inch, one inch, depending on your type of rigid insulation over the wood studs. Now we all know that wood studs perform better than metal studs. But wood has an R value of about 1.25 per inch. And fiberglass, for example, has an R value of, say, 3 or 3.3 or 3.5 per inch. So you see that the insulation is still performing three times better than the wood stud itself. So the wood, in effect, is a thermal bridge there. So this is a way to minimize that even for the wood assemblies. For the U factors, um, with fall tables, go to table A 3.4 in the appendix. And I also want to mention, and there's another table at the end of chapter 9, table A 9.4C, which shows you the effect of compressing insulation. So for example, if you took an R19 bat, which typically is going to have a 6 inch thickness or so, and you decide, well, you want to put it in a 2 by 4 wall, and so 2 by 6 this table will indicate that you only get R13 out of that. So sometimes we see this situation. Um, we see designers come in or contractors. They want to achieve the R19, and they're used to building 2 by 4 walls, and they just figure they'll buy thicker insulation and stick it in the same framing. You end up losing all the additional value. So there's, if you're only going to get R13 in the 4 inch stud, you might as well buy R13 and not buy the R19. If you want the true R19, then it needs to go in the 6-inch stud. 
for walls below grade, this is any portion that's entirely below the finished grade, um, the requirement in Climate Zone 5 is R7.5 continuous insulation. Typically, this would mean an inch and a half of rigid insulation. So this is a change from 2004, where actually there was no requirement for these walls in Climate Zone 5. Um, the insulation must be continuous across the wall. Again, if you've got metal or wood studs, you need to use the C factor tables. And let me talk about these C factor tables. So they're in Appendix A, Table A 4.2. The C factor does not include the R values for exterior or interior air films or for soil. So it differs from the U factor. The U factor tables would include everything from inside air film to outside air film and all the materials in between. The challenge with soil is that the conductivity varies widely around the country, and it also varies depending on the moisture content of the soil. And these things are such a wild card and hard to get good information on that uh, ASHRAE decided to make the standard simpler and just specify the assembly that you're constructing itself and not include the R values. I will tell you, though, that the decisions on what the criteria sh should be were based on analysis that included the effect of the soil. And when you go to the ENVSTD program, when you go through that process, it does include some buffering effect for the soil. But that was also used in setting the prescriptive criteria, so it doesn't mean that it's going to be lead to any different results. Now let's move to the three floor categories. The uh, first one is mass floor. Um, Similar description as previously uh, for the wall. And here the criteria are 10.4 continuous insulation for climate zone 5, previously R8.3. A couple of extra thoughts about floors. If you have a waffle slab, section A5.2.2.3 says you have to insulate either on the interior above the slab or on all exposed surfaces of the waffle. So it's not acceptable to just run continuous insulation or batch or whatever across the waffles and leave that open air gap. That air cavity, you start to get air movement and it doesn't perform as well. Um, similarly, for concrete beams, you need to either insulate above or around the concrete beams themselves. And the assembly U factors are in table A5.2. For steel joist floors, we're talking about steel joists supported by structural members. The insulation requirement for 2007 in Climate Zone 5 is R30, and that's up from R19 in 2004. A couple of comments about floor insulation. Section 5.8.1.5 requires that the floor insulation be installed in substantial contact with the inside surface. This is Sometimes an issue for steel joists, also for wood joist floors. If you just have the insulation um, even with the bottom of the joist and you allow some airspace above the top of the insulation before the floor, again, we see some convective loops getting set up and uh, they bypass the insulation. You don't get the full R value of that. Here for the assembly U factors, go to table A5.3 and be aware here, again, the, the short circuiting when you install the insulation between the steel joists. Typically, the steel joists are spaced further apart than steel studs in walls. They're often just you know, a few thinner rods. They're not the continuous metal. And so you see some derating, but for example, if it's R30 insulation, you achieve R23 when you use that between metal framing that's four feet on center. So not as bad as the wall studs, but again, there's the derating there. The last floor category is wood frame floors. And this is wood joist floors, but all other floor types. Here, there's no change from 2007 for Climate Zone 5. The insulation requirements are 30. A um, couple of comments here. Um, Section 5.8.1.5 indicates that the floor insulation has to have supports that are no greater than 24 inches on center. So again, particularly if you have some types of insulation that's bad insulation and it's not rigid, it's very important to have those supports so that it 
and you keep it uptight against the floor. And the assembly U factors are in table A 5.4. Switching to the two slab on grade floor types. So a slab on grade is a floor that's in contact with the ground and it's um, either above grade or 24 inches or less below the final elevation of the nearest exterior grade. So it does not include basement floors, but anything which goes down up to two feet below the nearest exterior grade. There's two categories, unheated slab, which is a, heated, is a slab that does not have heating elements, or a heated slab, which is one that has a heating source either within it or below it. So for the unheated slab, there are no requirements that you insulate around the perimeter. For the heated slab in Climate Zone 5, there's a requirement that you have R15 insulation that goes down 24 inches around the perimeter. R15 is typically going to be 3 inches of rigid insulation. And the challenge here with heated slabs is that you know the slab itself is probably heated to 80 degrees, and you're trying to maintain 70 inside. So you have a situation where there's constantly some heat going up into the condition space, but also heat going down. And this rigid insulation around the perimeter keeps that from spreading. There are two types of door categories. This is the last opaque category. Um, for the door itself, be considered any operable opening which is not fenestration. So we're not talking about storefront doors that are made out of glass, um, but it includes swinging and roll-up doors, fire doors, access hatches. Any doors which are more than half glass are considered fetestration. So this is typically going to be the fire exit doors and warehouse type of doors. So if it's a swinging door, like a fire exit door, and opaque revolving doors, that's a rare situation, but there are a few of those, then the Q factor is required to be 0.7. If it's a non-swinging door, so a roll-up door, the U-factor requirement for 2007 has been reduced to 0 0.50. It used to be 1.45, which was essentially uninsulated. So now it means that these non-swinging doors, these warehouse type of doors, are going to need to be insulated to comply with this criteria. So that's the overview of the opaque assemblies. Now let's move on to fenestration. And here's where there's a number of changes in categories for 2007. Now, the definition has not changed. The definition of fenestration in Section 3.2 is all areas, in, including the associated frames, that let in light, including windows, plastic panels, clear storage, skylights, glass doors that are more than half glass, and glass block. Essentially, if it's not insulated, such as an insulated roof wall or floor, then it's considered fenestration. Now, the criteria for fenestration are U-factor criteria and solar heat gain coefficient criteria. For U-factors, the requirement is that they be determined in accordance with NFRC 100. And for skylights, those are actually determined at a slope of 20 degrees above the horizontal. A couple of points worth noting, these ratings are, and the criteria in standard 90.1 are for the overall product. So this includes glass, sash, and frame. This is not the center of the glass. So make sure when you're looking for ratings that you're looking at the overall product. And uh, just as an example, um, you can have some products, if you have a metal frame that does not have a thermal break or it's not thermally improved, the U factor for the overall product can actually be twice as high as the center of glass. So it makes a big difference in terms of the framing. And also, um, given heat flow dynamics, the products at a slope have higher heat loss. And so you'll see that the skylight U factors tend to be slightly higher than the vertical U factors for that reason, even if it has the same assembly. NFRC 100 was first published 17 years ago at this point, 1991. Um, it's certified by the U.S. Department of Energy as compliant with the Energy Policy Act requirements. The way the process works, um, Standard rating conditions are specified. Standard sizes are specified. So you, you have an apples-to-apples apples comparison. So this is similar to the 
a situation for mechanical equipment, for example. You know, if you have a heat pump, the heat pumps are all compared in the same way. If you have a furnace, the rating conditions are the same for that for all the various sizes, all the various installations. This standard 100 for NFRC includes all the product types. It's included glazed wall fittings systems, curtain walls and storefronts since the beginning in 1991. Includes sloped glazing like you might see in atriums, uh, other punched openings, skylights, casements, so operable windows, awnings, sliders, um, includes sliding doors, sliding doors. And for compliance, the ratings are based on simulation, not testing. So sometimes you hear people talk about tested values. Again, for the NFRC rating system, it's based on simulations. There is some limited testing that is done for value for validation. If you want to pursue this more, you can go to the NFRC website at nfrc.org, and all of their standards are available for download for free there. Now, for solar heat gain coefficient, the companion standard is NFRC 200. Here again, we're doing the calculation for the overall fenestration area. With solar heat gain coefficient, there is an allowance, though, that you can use shading coefficient multiplied by 0 0.86, provided that that shading coefficient is from a spectral data file determined in accordance with NFRC 300. So all the glass manufacturers have gone through a process where they have submitted their data, it goes through peer review, and then it ends up in the spectral data file. So any of this information is information that you can trust, so it's, it's been through the peer review. There is another exception to the solar heat gain coefficient requirement that allows you to use the SHGC for the center of the glass instead of for the overall product. And um, you might think that um, this would give you a comparable or a much better rating. As it turns out, um, if you go through this route, you don't get full credit, that you're actually better off taking credit for the opaque portion of the frame. But even as such, the opaque portion solar heat gain coefficient is not zero. For metal frames, it can range from 0.11 to 0.14. Uh, for wood, vinyl, or fiberglass frames, it's much lower, but it's still in the range of 0.02 to 0.07. And so it's almost always a situation where the solar heat gain coefficient for the frame is lower than that for the glass. And so you're better off taking credit for the overall product. When you go through the NFRC process, or when a manufacturer goes through that, they get U-factor solar heat gain coefficient and visible light transmittance all as part of the same evaluation. So it's, if you get the U-factor for the overall product, you should have the SHGC for the overall product. And certainly ask the manufacturer for that. Last item, I, I did want to mention visible light transmittance. There is not a specific requirement in the prescriptive path that you comply with visible light transmittance characteristics. But if you go through the ENV STD compliance option, then you do have to show what the visible light transmittance is. And here, that must be determined in accordance with NFRC 200, like the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, again, the VLT comes out of the same rating process that gives you the factor in SHGC, so that information will be available. It's very important for daylighting, and you can get some very good products now that used to be with the older bronze glass, the amount of light transmitted was equal or lower than the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, with the new products, you can actually get twice as much light as you get heat. And so look for those high-performance glazing products. In terms of the ratings themselves, um, they have to be determined, both the factor and the SHGC, by a laboratory accredited by a nationally recognized accreditation organization such as the NFRC. The advantage of this, and why you want this, it means that the ratings are done by a qualified third party, independent party. And the software, it's actually something that's out there. Again, you can download it from websites. Um, anybody can use it. It's been a boon for product designers, because now they've started to use this to improve on their products and their framing. So rather than building mock-ups, arranging time to go to a test lab, you know, paying a test lab to test the performance. Now you can go through the 
kind of RC simulation software and figure out if you tweak this cavity or if you put the thermally improved portion here or if you change the thermal break like this, you can see what the effect would be. Um, there are some default values for unlabeled products in appendices A81 and A2, but they're very limited. So um, I really encourage you to get the NFRC rating. That's where you're going to get the true value for the products. There also is a requirement that products be labeled either with a um, permanent information which has the U-factor SHGC or by certification. And there's two types of labelings that you would typically see um, as a designer or as a inspector. For manufactured products, they come with a 4x4 label which is installed on the window, for example, at the factory before it leaves the factory. For site built products, you get an 8.5 inch label certificate. And let me show you a couple of examples of those. So here's the 4x4 inch label. You see in the upper right hand corner, it'll have the manufacturer's name, maybe the model number, and some description of the product. So this one, for example, says it's vinyl clad wood frame, it's got double glazing, it has argon gas fill in between the panes, it's got a low emissivity coating, and the product type is vertical slider. And then you can see the, the U factor, the solar heat gain coefficient, the visible transmit, and the air leakage values. So it's easy to take a look at these to verify compliance. For the um, projects that you have where people are doing curtain wall construction, the 4x4 label would show up in the upper right hand corner, but there would be some more information about the product location, something about the product line, how many of those products are in the building where it's shown on the drawings, and then specific information about who's supplying the frame material, who's supplying the glazing material, and who is the glazing contractor that's doing the installation. And the last piece at the bottom is the certification authorization, which needs to be signed by an independent inspection agency that, such as the ones accredited by NFRC. If you want to find out more information about the um, facilities, the laboratories that do the simulations and tests, or about these independent inspection agencies, the list of all the qualified ones are posted on the NFRC website, again, at nfrc.org. Now let's move back to, once you've got those ratings, what you're going to do with those in standard 90.1. So first, for calculation, that the gross wall areas and gross roof areas have to be calculated separately for each space conditioning category for determining compliance. So that means if you've got a mixed-use building, you've got 10 floors of residential over one or two floors of retail, for example, that you would need to separate out those portions of the building and do calculations separately. Once you've separated those categories out, you can do area-weighted averaging. So it's acceptable, for example, to average operable windows and the fixed windows to show compliance overall. Now the fenestration area is the total area measured using the rough opening, including glazing sash and frame. So it's not just the visible light transmitting area, it's the whole rough opening. So for the doors, if the glazed vision area is less than 50%, then it's just the glazed vision area, but otherwise it's the entire door area. Now for the two different categories, there's vertical glazing and skylights. And vertical glazing is, as you might expect, it's primarily vertical, but it's everything that's not skylights. And skylights are defined as anything with a surface having a slope of less than 60 degrees from the horizontal. So again, it doesn't matter where it's being mounted. It doesn't matter if it's being mounted in something called a wall or called a roof. It's the slope of the fenestration that counts there. So for example, when you think about some of the older lighting that was used in industrial facilities, they would have roof monitors and clear story windows. And those are vertical fenestration, even though they're mounted above the worker in what people might consider to be the roof, the fact that they're vertical would mean they would must comply with the vertical fenestration criteria. 
for vertical fenestration in terms of area, the limits are specified in section 5.5.4.2. The total vertical fenestration area has to be 40% or less of the gross wall area, and skylight area 5% or less of the gross roof area. So we'll note for skylights, this is the same as 2004. For vertical fenestration, the 2004 version of standard 90.1 actually had some options that went up to 50% window area, but the criteria had been specified for 10, 20, 30, and 40% window area, and the 50% option included in the tables was a pre-calculated prescriptive trade-off that had equal energy to the 40% path. So even though you see the differences between 50% and 40% between 2004 and 2007, really it's a comparable baseline that 40% was the maximum used to set the criteria, and there just happened to be a pre-calculated compliance option in the 2004 version that has not been included in the 2007. There are some exceptions here, and I will note for street-level retail, if it's on the street side, you can have up to 75% window area, provided that there's an overhang which is at least a 0 0.5 or projection factor 0 0.5 or greater. So, for example, this means that if you've got a, say, a 12-foot tall street-level space, if you had an overhang that was 6 feet, then that would give you the 6 divided by 12 would be the 0.5 projection factor. For the U-factor criteria, in 2004, the previous version it varied depending on whether it was operable or fixed. And the operable criteria for U factors was less stringent than the one for fixed. But it was the same for all framing materials. For 2007, it parallels what's in the ICC documents. So there's a non-metal framing category. So this would be if you have wood or vinyl or fiberglass frames. The U factor criteria is 0 0.35. So comparable to what you might see for residential type windows in Climate Zone 5. Um, for metal for curtain wall and storefront, it's slightly higher to 0 0.45. If it's an uh, entrance door with metal framing, 0 0.80. And this has to do with the fact that some of these entrance doors have larger metal kick plates or things at the bottom, which mean they have higher heat loss because there's more metal in them. Other metal products, including operable products, but also other fixed windows that are not considered curtain wall, have a U-factor requirement of 0.55 maximum in Climate Zone 5. So for 2004, you could typically achieve the values with double glazing with a very good low emissivity coating. And uh, if you had a wood or vinyl frame or fiberglass, actually it meant you didn't even need the low E. Um, for 2007, though, with the criteria being split by the framing type here now, you need the double with the very good low E, and you would also need a thermal break in the frame to achieve those values. For the solar heat gain coefficient, in 2004, there were requirements that varied depending on whether it was north-oriented or other-oriented, again, paralleling the IECC, now it's the same for all areas and all orientations. Uh, for Climate Zone 5, 0 0.4 solar heat gain coefficient maximum. Also, I'll point out there is an exception here which allows you to take credit for some permanent projections that will last as long as the building itself. And remember the key portion here, it has to be a permanent projection and it has to last as long as the building itself. So. This could be some sort of metal screening, or could be different things, some wood lattice. If you have a smaller building, it would typically not include fabric awnings, which would not last that long. For skylights, um, three different categories, glass with curb, plastic with curb. The U factor is um, 1.17 for the glass with curb, 1.10 for the plastic with curb, no change from 2004. If it's a skylight without a curb, such as slope glazing that you would see in an atrium, it's a 0 0.69 maximum. The reason for the differences between the U-factor is that if you have a skylight that's built up on a curb, the U-factor is determined based on the rough opening in the roof. 
and the total surface area, including the sides of the curbs, can be double the rough opening area, so that it's not surprising the factors would be twice as high. Solar heat gain coefficient, also no changes here from the 2004 version. Um, you see the guy like the glass with curb SHGC of 0 0.39 and the plastic 0 0.62, all materials without the curb 0 0.39. The key difference here, uh, glass skylights, you can achieve the same SHGC as vertical fenestration with the same low E coating. If you've got a plastic skylight, you need to go to other technologies. Some of the things being looked at for the 2010 version of standard 90.1, there may be some requirement for automatic control of the lighting underneath these skylights to take advantage of the daylighting. That was a summary of the prescriptive requirements. The other option here, if you don't want to use the prescriptive or if you have a large window area or some other elements, um, you can go to the ENV SCD trade-off option. It gives you more flexibility, but again, you have to do all the input, so it's more work for you. Um, again, the trade-offs are limited to the building envelope, so it does not include lighting in HVAC. So there are some inputs or some um, material that's in the calculation engine, which makes assumptions about lighting values and HVAC efficiencies, but that's not something that you can vary as part of this compliance option. It is based on daylighting, though, and so you need a good visible transmittance. You'll quickly find that if you don't have a visible transmittance, you'll fall behind on this. Uh, the methodology and assumptions are in Appendix C, and the user's manual provides a good example to take a look at. That's standard 90.1. Um, Next steps, what are other folks looking at or what's something that will get you additional energy saving? Because we know this is not the last word. If you look at ASHRAE USGBC IESNA standard 189.1P, this is a new standard that's being developed. And the goal here is to achieve a 30% additional energy savings beyond that in standard 90.1-2007. There's a public review draft that's out for review now through April 7th. And if you want to take a look at that, I would download it now. The way the ASHRAE process works is that once the public review period closes, that will be removed from their website until it's published as a final standard. So I download that now if you want a copy of it. Within that, as you might expect, it calls for more insulation, better windows. It also expands beyond 90.1 to look at fenestration orientation, the exterior shading, specifies a continuous air barrier. And to give you some examples of what products and buildings might be using some of those technologies, um, here's a picture of a 48-story hotel condominium project that's um, in Vancouver, British Columbia. It has a U factor of 0 0.21 for a three-layer system. So there's ways that you can achieve values that are twice as good as the ones that were shown as the criteria for Climate Zone 5. And even more efficiency, here's a, another building that's also just across the Canadian border um, in Vancouver, British Columbia. And here's an office building with a four-layer system and with a U factor of 0 0.14. So these are both products with metal framing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be wood or vinyl. You can get there with metal frame systems and have very high performance if you have a very good thermal break. If you want more information, um, standard 90.1 can be downloaded from the ASHRAE website at ashrae.org. There's a user's manual to accompany the document. And other training opportunities, information will be available from ASHRAE. And if you want more information on the standard and compliance tools, you can also check with the DOE-sponsored website, energycodes.gov. Well, at this point, that concludes the presentation here today. Um, and I'll move back to you, Rose. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for an informative webcast, John. And thanks to all of you. The U.S. Department of Energy appreciates your attendance.